So I just first want to um, thank everyone for coming and thank the Rennie Collection um, for working with us on the Rennie Collection speaker series, which uh, has been going for five years now. So um, we're very excited tonight to um, have uh, Mircha Cantor here uh, to give a talk about his work. Um, and his exhibition is opening at the Rennie Collection uh, this weekend. So. Um, the reflective work of Romanian artist Mircea Cantor is the subject of this exhibition opening at the Wing Sang, um, Rennie Collection at Wing Sang. It's his first solo presentation in Canada, um, but his work has been the subject of solo and group exhibitions at institutions throughout the world, including the Tate Modern, the Centre Pompidou in Paris, the Tel Aviv Museum of Art in Israel, the Walker Art Centre in Minneapolis, and the Museo Tamayo in Mexico City. In 2011, he was awarded the prestigious Prix Marcel Duchamp, given to an outstanding young artist working in France. Um, so I also just want to mention that um, the viewing of his exhibition will be taking place on Wednesdays and Saturdays um, throughout the duration of the exhibition. And if anyone wants uh, to register for a tour for the exhibition, you can go to um, the Rennie Collection website, which is www.renniecollection.org. Um, and the tours of the exhibition are led by interns uh, from Emily Carr and UBC who, take play, uh, who um, have been taking part in the Wing Sang internship program, which has also been running for five years. So um, I just wanted to mention that. If anyone has any other questions, you can ask me after the talk as well. So please join me in welcoming Mir Chikantar. Good evening, everybody. <laughs> Well, she did the introduction, so I start <laughs> directly. I am happy that you came for this presentation. And um, I will start, uh, well, I... With this still image, it's a, it's a still image from a movie that I saw recently that um, maybe... Do you hear me? <laughs> I'm sorry. No. <laughs> sorry. But it goes after a while. Now like this? Okay. <laughs> so. It's a film, it's called um, Call Me of Senor Riku. It's about the tea master, Japanese famous tea master. And uh, it's an updated version of what we call the, um, the book of tea. And uh, the film is very beautiful, but I like it the way how he mentioned step by step the revelation of the beauty in the, the way of how he should be in, in life applied. So from the fact how you will drink the, the tea, how will you build a room for drinking the tea, so how he would choose uh, the cup for a certain um, ceramist. So I, I like it, this as an introduction to, to my speech tonight. Just to remind you, these legends will grow from the object I choose. Because as an artist, I think it's very important what we choose. And what we choose uh, when we start to do art. Um, I am telling you this because uh, you will notice in my practice that there are various mediums that I use. I am not attached to a particular one. I use photography, I use sculpture, I use um, installation, and I am telling you that I'm use, I'm using all these mediums to make art. It's not I am making sculpture, I make art. So, let's start. This is a work that I did in 2000. I was in, uh, in France, I just arrived in France, I quit Romania, and it's a big photography, 
about, I, don't, I have the centimeters measurements, it's like two, two meters per 137 centimeters. Uh, and in fact, it's, a, it's called All Directions. It's, a, it's supposed to be for a group show in New York, and my visa was denied at that time because they considered I'm a potential immigrant. So I, I wanted to, to participate, though, in that exhibition. And um, I, I wanted to make a performance. So I made a hitchhike outside Nantes, where I, I studied. And I wrote on the cardboard all the uh, heaven. But I found after a while that writing heaven, like hitchhiking for America, the big dream, etc., it is too literal, too banal. So then I, I changed it for a blank card. And I said, this is all the direction. You should go wherever you want, not at a certain place. This is a series of photography. It's called Shortcuts. I will show you like this. It's a triptych. And um, it was shot in my hometown in Romania in 2004. And what interested me, the, um, the idea of the shortcut that is very close in my, very strong in my practice, how we as a human uh, cross different parts in urban areas, but this shows a certain affinity of our behavior, you know? We always try to avoid certain things, even though we have the precise direction that is marked, like official direction. Eh? And um, I like it this that it shows a certain flexibility of the, of the human spirit that is applied in the urban area. So it's just to show how they look like. This work is, was my first solo show in New York at my gallery, and it's called The Second Step. And uh, what I did in the whole gallery, I poured concrete cement, and um, the whole gallery was in dark, so you would have light only when you opened the door, and you would see this step. And in fact, it's a Neil Armstrong step, the step on the moon, so it will be enlightened by the earth light, no? It was this idea of um, creating a desire for something that we would never be able to touch, because this image we all know, it was shot in 69 and it was so mediatized, but we never had a, a concrete feeling of it. We never touched it like the stars on the, in Hollywood, you know, the the mark of the stars, the hands on the steps. So I, I had this idea that we should really see how it would have looked, the concrete, in concrete, this mark. And why concrete? Because I started at that time to be preoccupied in materials that are very specific to our, uh, our time. No? When Augustus came to Rome, he said that uh, I found Rome in bricks and I left it in marble. So the concrete is the marble of our times. That's why I, I used the concrete. Uh, this is a work that I did in San Antonio in 2007, I think seven. And it's called Talking Mirror. It's a very expensive cowboy hat that I filled with oil. And in fact, you could uh, reflect yourself into it. The idea behind this was um, how two very strong uh, identity items could annihilate each other. So on one part, you have the cowboy hat, which all we know, it's connotated with a certain macho power, and then you have the oil. And um, what was interesting that during the exhibition, people would look into the mirror and um, they would touch it eventually and then spill it on the hat. 
So, for, of course, the museums and uh, galleries were very angry, but for me, showed this, um, how do you say, this uh, appeal to, to destroy things, you know, involuntarily. This is a series of um, photography that are called the Holy Flowers. It was for my solo show in 2010 in uh, Tel Aviv at my gallery. And in fact, there are weapons from the Israeli army that we borrowed. And I arranged them as a kaleidoscope so that it will disappear, this kind of ag aggressivity. They will recall a certain I would say, interlux, a certain decoration from the Middle East, that you, that you, the rosas, you, you have. They're almost like snowflakes. So these images are not manipulated. I will show you after how they were made. So no Photoshop. This is the way how they were presented at the Yokohama Triennale in 2011. In Nuremberg in Germany. So that's the way how they were made with two mirrors and you would have the guns under the mirrors. Yeah, this is a work of uh, William Blake, and it's called Europe Supported by Africa and America. And um, I took it as a departure point for a big exhibition that was held in Naples, in Italy, about the Baroque in 2011. The curator, the director of the museum invited me for doing a commission for this exhibition. And I took it as a departure point. So I, I, I said, look, I would like to make a paraphrasis of William Blake's uh, etching, 18th century. And I did uh, this photography, but I changed America to Asia. So the title of the work is uh, Europe Supported by Africa and Asia. Of course, because of the whole economical process and change through the century that Europe is much more supported by Asia and Africa rather than America. This is a puzzle, a mirror puzzle that, uh, that has the shape of the map of Israel it was my second show in my gallery in 2010. And uh, the idea was that, um, for those who, who were in Israel, the idea of the territory which is very strong and uh, very, very connotated is uh, the idea of the borders, of the property, very important. So I, I, I told them that I would like to make a map of Israel out of the mirror so that you could replace each of the part which is missing with other part that is missing on the other, other parts of the same map. So you would doesn't matter 
what you you replace the, the the puzzle is the same the land is the same it's called one piece the same it can be piece as a piece or piece as an element it was also very much related to the the fact that you can reflect yourself into the mirror so once you take the piece of puzzle in your hand, you have this uh, self-reflection. So that means that the land is formed by by the people, no? So you you manipulate it in a way. Unpredictable future. <laughs> this is a light box that you will see here at um, Rennie Collection. It's. Um, it's a very simple thing. I mean, the, the idea of the future started to preoccupy me around 2004 of uh, how we try to fix things, to predict things, to think that um, I think unpredictable future, the future, it's, it is unpredictable per se. You cannot predict. I mean, we try to predict it. But uh, I wanted to make it like a haiku poem in which these two words would annihilate one each other. This is a wall drawing that you will also see in, in the exhibition here at Rennie. It's called Chaplet. And in fact, it's a barbed wire made out of my fingerprints dipped in uh, typographic ink. The um, idea be beyond this chaplet, it was uh, related to the, um, the border, the limit of the... the li Do you hear me? I don't know, because... Okay. <laughs> Sometimes... <laughs> Uh, the the artist's body as a, as a limit, as an ultimate limit in making art, but more contextualized into the today's world where you have all these biometrical things that are more and more emerging in our lives. So this work started to be related when I, I started to come after 9-11 in the United States and you started to get the fingerprints and then the retina and the eye. So it's, it's something that really stressed me at the beginning. And then I said I should do a work out of that. So we all know that barbed wire means security, means protection. So it's very controversial. controversial. But I said, if uh, the CIA would have my fingerprints, that I want to make it public so everybody can have it. So that's why I make it like a wall drawing in the exhibition space. Well, this is a work. It's the first time I'm showing in a public presentation because I just discovered it. I made it when I was 19 years old in the high school. And it's called The Portrait of My Grandmother. <laughs> and it's interesting because I have already this fingerprint thing, but without any connotation. In fact, it's a very small work. It's something like that. And it's a, how do you say, it's a dry print. It's a dry print of a model that my grandmother used to make. And I just pass it under a pressure, under a, I don't know how we call it. And then I just added my two fingerprints, one in black and one in white. It also, uh, now that I look at it, it, it will recall the whole idea of the rosas, no? The shape of... Yeah, then I developed this uh, chaplet, chaplet, which means prayer beans, no? that you use, many religions has, you know, from Christianity, Buddhism, Islam, they have this kind of prayer being. So I like it that with your 
fingerprints, you are making this kind of prayer beans. This is rainbow. It's, uh, it's based on the same idea. I just used the, um, the colors of the rainbow in order to make it on, on a glass. So it's transparent. Well, this is called color silent. It was um, a solo show that I did in Germany in a gallery in Berlin, uh, Jonan. And in fact, uh, we bought a German police car and we reverted the siren inside the car. We placed it with the sound and with the light so you wouldn't hear the sound, you would just see the lights, but you wouldn't know from where they come if you are not very attentive, because the, the windows were quite dark. So this was re related to the relativity of, um, of the danger of the, um, of the authority of the violence. Hmm. This work is called uh, Nido in Italian, which means nest. And in fact, it's a ping pong table that has rearranged the, the nets, the middle part, in order to form a nest. So the world would look like this. And in fact, you have full eggs in the middle, and on the ground you would have just the eggshells, empty eggshells, that they had to change every week, because people would walk on it. This was, uh, this was made in Rome in 2007, and uh, at my gallery there. It was related to the idea of the conflict and violence and protection in the same time, so all we know is that a ping pong match is about eliminating the other. So based on this idea, I wanted to reshape the ping pong table so that you would create a safety area in which those who are, el are eliminated, you step on them. So it's this kind of who detains the power, who can step on the head of the others. It was a very strong experience in the exhibition because people would walk on it this is very, and they would crack the eggs shells. Fortunately, we were in Italy where they have a lot of pasta, so no problem for the eggs. This is a photo performance that I did uh, in 2005 or six, I think. It's called I Sell My Free Time. And I went to the market in Romania and I just put that uh, bor board on which I said I, I sell my free time. The idea of selling the, f the time, it was um, related to the um, unity, the value of what we have as a immaterial value that we, we can spend. No, because in English you have this expression, we spend time, we spend money. So um, the fact of selling your time is like you buy through your time other things. I mean, when you work, it, it was this idea that you, you don't earn money, you buy things through your time. That was the basic idea. It's like uh, time, no, money costs time. And I had an, an advertising in uh, some Belgian newspapers and then Dutch, in which we reverted this and said, time costs money. 
So to revert, what is the interest of... It's not the money that is important, it's your time as a capital or that you spend. I did the same this year in Tokyo, in Tsukiji. <laughs> they were laughing. Yes, this is a work that I did um, in 2008 for my touring show in Britain, in Bristol, in Oxford, and in um, Camden, in London. And in fact, um, the departure point was um, to reconsider some handcrafts from north of Romania, in which you have a region uh, north of Romania, which is called Maramures, and uh, where you still have a very lively tradition of wood carving and uh, building the houses in, in wood. So I went there and I discovered a very rich, rich, rich and still live culture. And um, the gates, there, were, there are many gates in front of the houses that uh, are decorated with various Christian or pagan symbols. And most of them relate to the idea of the tree of life. So I, I went there and I uh, collaborated with some artisans and asked them to uh, carve a gate of me, for me. But I would uh, replace all their symbols by the shape of the DNA. So uh, I made the design of the gate, I made the drawing, and we went there and they carved the, this gate. And then I covered it with 24 karat gold foil. So all the gate is covered in gold. This was in Shanghai in 2010 at the World Expo. next to the Chinese pavilion. This was in um, Paris, in Grand Palais. Yes. Uh, back to the DNA. Um, so from that exhibition on, I started to make researches around the, what is the DNA, what is the idea of genetical manipulation, so one poetic approach for this issue is this work which is called the DNA Keys, and in fact there are DNA columns made out of kisses of 12 girls from 12 different zodiac signs. But it's not a public performance, you see just the final wall drawing, but now you will have the privilege to see the making of because I'm showing it. So th this, this is back to what I told you at the beginning. I am using sculpture, I am using lipstick in order to make art. So for me, the important of the thing was to, to see a certain expression based on the necessity of the subject matter, not and why I didn't make it publicly, because I think that it would have turned in something very, I don't know, uh, amusing and something very funny and... You know, I just didn't want it. I wanted to have the final result so you can see a beautiful wall drawing made out of kisses. It is not even important that there are 12 women. I mean, it's nice to have a number because I am very much um, interested in a certain harmony, a certain inherent rule of how the things are made. For instance, the golden ratio. I'm using very much the golden ratio in my work because I think that there are certain things that you, you have to control in that way in order to make them happen.
Of course, it's a long preparation before they would make the kisses on the wall because um, they have to follow a line, they have to see how often they have to put the lipstick on their lips, so it's not easy. But at the end, you have this. This is in uh, Bucharest, in the Contemporary Museum in Bucharest, in Romania. This was in Germany. These are about, I don't know, 150, 160 inch, no, feet. Four meters, how would you? <laughs> 12 feet. It's quite high, it's this height. Seven future gifts. Again, the idea of the concrete. This was my major solo show in Hungary in 2008. And um, Hungary has a long tradition with concrete, so I, I've got in contact with a very, 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 very good craftsman in concrete, so that we work out for this gift. And it's a beautiful uh, exhibition space in which it's actually a sculpture hall. It meant to be at the beginning of the century. The idea of the, of the gift of the um, present came out as a um, with my first kids, you know, the Christmas and uh, the family, what is in the gift, what. And uh, I wanted to develop it into something immaterial. I mean, that's why I choose just to have the ruban of the gift and not the gift in itself. And you have it on the different sizes because I like it that you can pass into it, and then for the smaller one, you just can hold it in your hands. So once again, the, the concrete, this material that is very connotated, and not marble or plastic or whatever, <coughs> is the idea of the surprise, the um, unpredictability that uh, I have mentioned earlier in the in the light box. Then this year I had a show in Italy in my gallery in Rome and um, I decided to make another set of gifts but only in one scale also because the gallery is not very big. And um, I wanted to make a black in black Marquinha marble, which is very hard to carve. They are in one piece, and black, white Carrara marble, and then the concrete ones. So I like it, this um, uh, connotation of black, white, gray, like the, the triptych that you have uh, here. I mean, as we are talking about future gifts, you know, you have this connotation in visual arts that black is something that it's bad, no? It's something that it's not pleasant, and then the white, of course. So to have this preciousness and also, but it's interesting to see them uh, one next to each other. And um, when I show it in, in Rome, it was, Interesting how people related because it was white marble and many of them they liked the concrete. It was interesting, no? Why? So they are in one piece of marble, it's not or concrete.
This is a work that I made in Santiago de Compostela in Spain for a big group exhibition in public art, in public space, sorry. And uh, it's called Which Light Kills You? And in fact, it's a, it's an oil, it's an antique oil lamp made in terracotta on which you have this rope that will continue to other elements this star that is carved also in north of Romania. And then uh, simplified or uh, stylized hanging tree. So the rope would go in this way. Which light kills you? We are in Spain, we must do, we are in Santiago de Compostela, which is a city, very important city for uh, Christianity. We had all these inquisition issues behind, so I wanted to respond in a way uh, strongly for that particular context. The rope, uh, for those who know the Santiago Cathedral, it they have a kind of... Um, it's called butafumero, and they have its, its kind of chandelier with incense in, and they balance it all over the central space of the cathedral. If you look on YouTube, you can see it's something very spectacular. So that rope, they changing it uh, once, 20 years. So I could get via the curator's mother the rope of the cathedral, who convinced the popes and the clergy that it's important commission. Stranieri, it's a word that I did in 2007. Stranieri, which means strangers. And this quite autobiographical -referen referential work for me, because my grandmother used to say that you should never cut the bread with a knife because of this uh, Christian tradition that the bread is the body of the Christ. So, um, I, and then I remember that w when we had wounds, or we, she should, she had uh, to put salt on it in order to stop the bleeding. So I made this installation uh, in France on, it's a huge, huge table with 49 baguette and knives cut, and then you have the salt, like... But also, uh, you have this um, symbolic meaning of the salt and the, and the bread that is, it's meant to be hospitality, you know, from Greece to Roman, and then continuing on the tradition that you would uh, welcome somebody's with uh, somebody on the road with salt and, and the bread to feed it. Anima, it's the title of this work. And this was my first major solo show in Rome in 2012 and uh, at the Macro, Museum of Contemporary Art in Rome. And uh, the, what you see here, it's the reduced scale of the replica of the St. Peter Basilica of the Vatican based on the original plans of Bramante. It's a very simplified version, which, uh, which is built in a technique that I employed with uh, the artisans from the north of Romania, in which you don't have any nail, it's just assembled. So you have this structure, very simplified structure of the cathedral, and to which you would have uh, attach this uh, puppet, marionette, linked with the rope. So anima in uh, Italian means, in Latin, it means uh, wind, it means soul, it means something that is moving. 
So I like it, this Ukmon connotation. It, it had to be a, a very strong statement to have a first solo show in Rome, not uh, in an institutional context, to have something very, very imposing and very related to the context. Back to the DNA, uh, this is a work that I did in the same, in the same exhibition and it's called uh, Epic Fountain and in fact it's, uh, it's a column made out of safety pin in gold, gilded in fact, plated by the jewelerist in north of Italy where you have a very big chain of jewelry production. So you have these safety pins in a very precise they measure. They are based on number of P. I like it, this idea of safety one more time and the DNA that we talked before. And uh, how a very simple element that is safety pin uh, traveled the times because safety pin as we know is the um, child of the fibula of the antique fibula the jewelry that used to for the romans or for the greeks they used to to dress in a how we say in a kind of big scarf like a sari you no know? and uh, they would attach it here so that's how they use use the safety pin and in the 19th century an american rediscovered and patent it as a, as it as we know it today so what is is beautiful about the, the safety pin i mean it's a it's a thing that it was used for the pampers for the babies and in italian it's called spila da balia it's a nurse needle it's something that holds things together and uh, Making them, making it in a DNA is, is something that it's like a gate. No, it's like a, because we try to uh, to open the DNA to to manipulate it. So it's nice to find this relationship with the DNA and the safety pin. So when we decide to open, when we decide to close it, and how. The way how it's done, I mean, you cannot see the, um, the welding in between them. Do you have the sensation that they are floating? This was in Pompidou in my exhibition in 2012 when I had the Marcel Duchamp Prize. And behind you can see the video, Sic Transit Gloria Mundi. And on the wall is a big rosette that you will have the chance to see it at the Rani collection. And discover it. I don't want to talk about that now. And I'll end with this still image. It's another film that you will see at the Rani collection. It's called Wind Orchestra, and uh, it is what you see here.
a young boy blowing over three Japanese knives. This, this idea of... Uh, I used to make several films with, uh, with my son. Very simple short video. I have one that... Um, maybe I have it here that shows him cutting the water flow of the tap, from the tap with a scissor, but it's a one second video. So you hardly stop, seven seconds black, then again. It's, a, it's, it's this image of fragility that I, I try to underline through very simple means, like, you know, cutting the water with the, with the scissors or blowing over the knives. And um, this idea of fragility, of ephemerity, of um, of vulnerability, I found it very beautiful in a quotation from the Talmud that I lately discovered. And I would like to read it to you. So, it says, it is said in the Talmud that God have created ten strong things. And it says, the rock is strong, but iron can break it. The iron is strong, but fire can melt it. The fire is strong, but water can extinguish it. The water is strong, but clouds can hold it. The clouds are strong, but wind can disperse them. The wind is strong, but man can face it. The man is strong, but fear can break it. The fear is strong, but the wine can drown it. The wine is strong, but sleep can erase it. The sleep is strong, but the death is stronger than all. That's it. I was told that, but I didn't look after that. Other questions? I have I have to ask you that this um this question because I, I think it, it goes to um how, how things get made, which is a, a concern of a lot of students. And that is how you finance these very, um, very expensive works. I was l thinking about that with the... Um, can you speak in the mic? Because yeah, I can you hear me now? No, yes. All right. Looking at some of these pieces, it occurs to me that they're very expensive to manufacture. It's the true. Cutting of the marble, for example. Mm -hmm. even, even the cost of the marble must be considerable. And then the, um, the concrete um, gift ribbons. I would imagine those are very expensive works. And I'm just wondering how you finance them. Via my galleries and via the institution that invites me and wants to commission these works. There is a budget that is spent on the production of this. Thank you. How important is it for you to uh, engage the audience in your pieces or to create an uh, engagement that goes further than uh, just looking Say at the Say it louder. Work? It's oh, sorry about that. Um, I'm a student at the 
okay. university. And I'm wondering um, how much emphasis do you put on the engagement of the audience mm -hmm. that goes further than looking at the work and walking around it? Mm -hmm. Is this something you're, you're interested in? Or? In some of the works I am interested, but it depends on on the type of the work, you know? The, for instance, you will have a, a film um, in the exhibition here, which is called Departure, and it's a film uh, in which you would see a wolf on the deer facing in a white space. For me, that experience, uh, relating to your question of the audience, it was very strong in New York because the film has no sound, and when people would walk into the gallery, they would have the tendency to, to be silent in order to hear the sound, but there is no sound. So it was very, very tense situation for the opening also where we are used that people are talking and you know, exchanging, that they suddenly kept silence and just look at the movie. There is another work here that it will engage you in the exhibition but I let you to discover. <laughs> Other questions? Oh. Are you comfortable with why you left art school in Romania? <laughs> <laughs> so, why I left the art school? <laughs> yes. <laughs> no, we can show it. <laughs> it's, uh, in fact, um, we were asked uh, the art school to, it's very, for me it's a very, um, I don't know, strange to give a speech in a context of an art school, because I quit the art school. <laughs> and so the best example is not really mine, because you are here in, to stay and to learn from your teachers, but for a long time I refused to give talks in the art school, because I never believed in art school. <laughs> And uh, also because I have a conflict with my teachers and uh, that ended up very badly. In the sense that uh, I was, we were asked in the second year to make a dialogue with the work in the art history. And uh, I chose Courbet, Origin of the World. So at that time I took a picture of my girlfriend. And, uh, and the same position was a black, because I was in the photo department so uh, we had to express ourselves in photography. So I, I made that picture, which was look really like a Courbet, Courbet's painting that is now on view at Orsay, Musée d'Orsay. And uh, they say, wow, what is this? Uh, it's pornography, you should have uh, Warna. So we are talking uh, 1998 in Romania. So at that period I decided, okay, I should go away because it's not a place to have a dialogue, it's not a place to... Of course, today it would, have been, it, it would be different, but uh, for me, what was important, it was that you don't have the ground to grow, to exchange, even though you have all the, you know, the the tools to do that. So I decided to go to France and study there. But even there I had a lot of problems because uh, uh, I must say that from the second year they took me directly into the postgraduate. So that was a bit of strange context. I mean, I didn't finish the art school but they already took me in the postgraduate, which was very, courageous and bold from the jury, you know. So. Does this one work? Hmm? This one works? You can hear yeah. me? Yes. I, my, you can hear me. Uh, no, I was just thinking when you said that this, high, this uh, art school experience, <clears throat> I don't know how old you were when you went to art school in Romania, but Something that stayed with you from that work, I suppose, is there is a kind of um, there's a there is a kind of anti-authority 
strand, obviously, in, in all your work. The difference, it seems, between that work, the way it came across to an audience, just to relate to the question about audience, seems to me uh, it's very easy to write that one off as a young male artist doing a shocking <laughs> experiment on his teacher and his students. Whereas I think what's interesting with your, the work you showed today mm. is um, it's not that you've disguised it, but it's harder to reject it when it's uh, couched. When you turn authority, whether it's weapons or whether it's religion or whether it's whatever, into a child's game. Like there seems to be something, like there's a very kind of poetic anarchist, like a or kind of childish anarchism that's, that's a bit deeper or something. Like it's harder to reject. Mm -hmm. Just wondering if, I don't know. Uh, if what? Well, I'm just wondering if, if, if you see, uh, it just seems, maybe it's because you, you ended with the image of this, this child blowing mm -hmm. these weapons down, or talking about your son cutting the, um, it's, um, it's very hard to, um, to, yeah, to write off. Uh, a gesture that's that's more natural or something mm -hmm. than contrived. I guess the that first act seemed like um, I don't know. There, it, I mean, it's a, uh, in all the work that I saw, it seems like a kind of uh, sometimes expensive, fine, but uh, generally a kind of dissolving of very. Of of, of power, like power structures of some sort, whether it has to do with gift exchange systems or I don't know whatever I can't remember mm -hmm. all the details. But so I'm just wondering if if you learn something from that experience as a student, <laughs> maybe the art school was good for you. Well, as a student, I don't know if I learned because um, I must confess that uh, my art school was the meeting with the artist in my town, in my country. And I used to travel a lot, really a lot, and knocking at the door with the works under my shoulder. And I said, can you give me an advice? Can we have a dialogue? So this is how I worked since the beginning. So that was my art school, meeting with real people which are really interesting and interested to have an exchange. Because in the problem with the school, in general was that you have a certain authority which imposes that you should learn from it, you know? And of course I want to learn, but the uh, learning is not one direction, it's, it's double head matches, you know? So that was the, the um, that work maybe it came randomly, I mean, may, sooner or later would explode anyway. But uh, the idea what, I mean, what interested me is was how to sublimate all this conflict into something else. So I'm not interested in the violence for the sake of the violence. I mean, it's something, I'm interested in poetry, okay? So that's in the power of the image, in the power of the artist creating through, uh, through certain associations of images because we are living in a world in which as artists you compete with everything. Not that you want to compete, you compete with on the street with everything, you know, with the shops, with everything. So what you do in your art, what you bring, not new, but what you bring different in what you do. That's what interests me. How you sublimate all this reality and not just reproduce them in the art gallery or in the museum, you know? So that's, that's, that's my really, I would say, a battlefield. Any other last questions? Okay, thank you again, Mirti. Thank you.